<laughs> this is Joey Diaz, known for his raw humor on sensitive topics, allowing him to make hilarious jokes. Close. Once yeah. I shove my tongue in your ass, you black out. It's like, <laughs> it's like you're 14 and your uncle's in <laughs> here. Being an ex-convict with crazy stories. Then they send you to a place where somebody looks you in the eye and says, strip down. And being a great comic that has the unique ability to entertain millions. Carney, New Jersey is about 22 minutes from Union City, New Jersey. My mother made it in eight minutes. <laughs> she shows up with eight Puerto Ricans and a Santeria priest with a live chicken, you understand? <laughs> That's when she goes down. So today, we will show you how this once orphan went from being a drug dealing addict to the legendary Joey Coco Diaz, and why there will never be another Joey Diaz. But dude, I was fucking crazy. My girlfriend's great. She don't get high, so I would trick her. I go, you gotta go to bed, dog. You gotta get eight hours. <laughs> You're at that age, you need every fucking day. Don't, don't worry about me, I'm a fucking comedian, this is what I do. Joey has a unique ability to tell stories as if he's describing it live as it happens, and this is by far his best ability as a comic. But before we show you his secret to win over crowds, we must first travel back in time to his childhood, where his extraordinary character was developed. On the tropical island of Cuba in 1963, Jose Antonio Diaz was born. Quickly after learning how to walk, he was forced to flee Cuba and move to America at only age three, when Fidel Castro's oppressive rule began. Shortly after arriving in New Jersey in 1966, Joey's life would change forever. My father died of heroin overdose, and it wasn't a heroin overdose. He thought he was doing a line of coke, and it was pure heroin. And when he did the line of fucking heroin, it just, he went into a coma. Joey's mother was now alone with a young boy to raise, and this shaped Joey's personality greatly, as his mother had a very strong character. I was raised by a woman that ran with men, like she had a bookmaking operation. Yeah. And I seen her getting into arguments with men, and go yourself, and go yourself, and I'd be scared for a minute. My mom had no victim in it. Joey's mom raised him to be a Catholic, and since he misbehaved a lot as a child, he was sent to a Catholic boarding school where he was disciplined more than he could imagine. But they would abuse me. If I didn't drink the milk, they'd put it on my head and then bitch slap me like three fucking times. And then when I went down, she hit me with the tray of food. These people were fucking savage. Unsurprisingly, Joey deeply resented the nuns, and after a while, he flipped out and showed signs that he was a troubled child. So we dragged this nun in a half a arm bar and a headlock, <laughs> and we took her shoes off. I don't know why till today. 300, she had no big fucking fat feet with no nail polish and shit. We took the feet out from under her and just dragged her. Her head was turning red. Despite all the adversity Joey faced growing up, he still showed signs of being a great actor in his early teens, and he actually won multiple performing arts awards in both high school and middle school. However, at age 16, Joey would have another life tragedy that would change things forever. Plain and simple, I was 16 years old, you know, I went downstairs and there she was on the fucking floor, you know. At that age, my world collapsed. You know, my mother didn't die in the hospital, my mother didn't die in a fucking car accident. My mother didn't die in none of that shit. I found him. This scarred Joey greatly, as he now had no parents and lost the connection with his mother who taught him everything he knew. I wasn't even recovering over my dad, and all of a sudden my mother died. So now you got two different forces meeting on you. Joey's life was now in the hands of the foster care system, and as he bounced around from foster home to foster home, the pain from his mother's death was still present and affected him. So it took me five years just to come to the realization that she was dead, and I went off the fucking rails. I went off the fucking handles. Joey then found himself getting caught up in the street life of drug dealing and committing crime, as he had no life direction and everyone was getting involved. Listen, when I was 17 years old, I found myself in this weird situation. I, I lived with this family after my mom died, and I befriended a cop, and he was just young but it was still 1981 and cocaine was starting to fucking come in and he had a cousin who sold coke and as soon as he became a cop him and his cousin couldn't be tight anymore so i became the go-between this was the beginning of a cocaine addiction that gave joey many wild experiences but i went over there and i looked in the box and he had a big bag of blow so like a month later i robbed martin my stupidity, I robbed him. Like, just like a jerk off that I was, it's 18 or 19. I robbed Martin, but I left my box in there. So this was 1982, 
In 85, I left Jersey, and I didn't talk to Martin. But let me tell you how bad of a bum Martin was. Martin knew that I visited my mom's grave, and he would leave me little notes. I'm going to fucking kill you, cocksucker. <laughs> and we'd sit on this ledge on Bergen Line Avenue and watch people speed and guess what they were doing, and the speed would come up on the thing. Even if they were speeding, he wouldn't chase them. Like, what's he doing? 55, 52, you lost. Do a line. Like, it was that type of relation. Then I got to a, a point after a month of that that other cops would meet us. And I, I still remember passing the Coke mirror to the car <laughs> next to me. And it's these two guys in uniforms. That's a scene in a fucking movie. But I saw that. In Joey's defense, his city was swarmed with cocaine, and for a young teen, it was impossible to avoid. Fucking cocaine and quaalude. Straight up, gangster. Straight up. And I'm 17 years old. And there's a way to make money off these ludes. You get them for $2 and you sell them for 4 You know how long 100 Quay ludes would last you when I was a senior, junior in high school? Three hours. Three hours. By the time you got them on 38th Street and you walked to 76th Street and you made strategic stops, they'd be gone. That's how fast. Inevitably, Joey started dealing cocaine, and as he grew older, he got deeper and deeper into it, and soon found himself selling to the pop icons of those days. They, they would come over, and I would sell Bobby Brown and Whitney Houston. You know, they would come over with like $1,100, which was per diem money. I was taking Whitney's per diem money, right? Every day, they'd come over with a little white envelope and give me the per diem money, and I'd go up to the Martel cartel, and I'd buy 14 grams of blow, take an eight ball out and cut it and then give it to Whitney Houston. But it wasn't all good for Joey, as dealing with drugs inevitably brought a lot of trouble with it. And this put Joey in a risky place. When I robbed that jewelry store with, with uh, Marblehead that time, when I was running up the corner, I was looking at grand larceny, you know, I'm looking at theft, I'm looking at a thousand things. I'm looking basically at 12 and a half fucking years. Uh, King Supers, that's a supermarket chain yeah. in Boulder. And I went there and I called my girlfriend. I told her what I had done. It backfired. The cops were looking for me and she's like, I'll come get you. And I checked my pockets and I realized I didn't have my weed with me. I left without my weed. So I walked around the back of the neighborhood, jumped in my house. The oh, cops were sitting God. in front of my house. I jumped in, took my weed in my pipe, and I left. Joey had so many run-ins with the law that he got very good at playing the legal justice system. So what my plan was to get a, since there was two fucking people, they hit him with a public defender, the other the biker, and they hit me with a court-appointed attorney because of this conflict of interest. That's why you oh. wait for him. If me and Lee <clears throat> get arrested, I wait for Lee to get the public defender first. And well, then they got to give you a different one. Then they got to give me a good one so, at 200 an hour. You, you know what I'm saying? Once Joey got caught for kidnapping, he ended up serving only 16 months for all his drug-related crimes, and managed to get away with selling countless kilos of coke, dozens of robberies, and a few other kidnappings. I kidnapped him. I did that. I got four years. I got all fucking easy. They should have thrown me in there for 10 fucking years. But people don't really How see How much them. time did you actually do? 18 months, 16 months. That's a long time. But it cost me two years of my life. Joey's 16 months inside gave him an even richer set of experiences, both good and bad. Then they send you to a place where somebody looks you in the eye and says, strip down, and you got to go take a shower, and then you come out and they put a finger up your ass to see if you got contraband. Then I got transferred to Summit County Jail, which was a fucking paradise. 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 Handball all day outside. TV till 2 in the morning. TVs really? in your cell. Black and white TVs in your cell. Basic cable. You could be up all night. You, you, wow. If you wanted to go to breakfast, you ate breakfast. If not, you could sleep through breakfast and we'd eat your breakfast for you. Surprisingly, whilst in jail, Joey found his life path. And it was actually the beginning of his stand-up comedy career. Bro, you gotta remember, I went to prison for four years, I got sentenced, but guess what I became? I became a stand-up comic. I learned how to do stand-up comedy in prison. in prison. So I'd be yelling at them, don't do it, don't do it, and then I would, don't do it, don't do it, and this went on, and I became like the social commentary for the kitchen. Uh, the projector broke, and they were like looking around like restless before they started throwing chairs or something, and that went on for a, a few weeks, and then they would just go, Cuba, go up there, and I would go up there and say super stuff, and... I didn't even know I was working on stand-up. I was just trying to kill time, you know. And this motherfucker looked at me and goes, listen, I'm going to get out of here in about two years. If I get out and you're not doing stand-up, 
I'm going to hunt you down and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Despite this clear signal to start stand-up, once Joey got out of jail, he chose to still have a life of crime. However, this time, it was much less sinister as he was solely focused on making a lot of money. What's your name? Tony Ramirez. Where have you pumped gas? Hess. Where? We hawking? Yeah. When can you start? What do you got? 12 to 8. I'm in. I'd get there at 12 and again, once I get a thousand, that's it. That's it. I put a dollar in the envelope. I just walk off. Oh, I did shit. this every two gas stations. Then I went across the street and worked myself back. 1200, 1800. God. It, it was damn. always something. I had a guy in San Diego that had a huge sports betting company. But he only signed you for the season. Okay. A lot of people are like, why am I going to pay you 3000 for the season? What if you suck the first month and I'm stuck with you? That's why I come in. But I'd make up some cockamamie story on how I'm going to sign him for a month. $2,250 for the fucking month. Un unlimited. If whatever I get, you get. I had some sources, but I was picking them myself. <laughs> I knew some of the football players in the Seahawks and I'd ask them creepy questions and shit. <laughs> well, what do you ask them? Like, who's looking good at practice? I gotta ask him, you know, when you played against these guys, how was the defense? Did they hit hard? What do you think? You know, stupid thing. Not enough to make you bet money on it. After a few years of hustling and scamming to survive, a $37 advert in a Denver newspaper for a stand-up comedy course gave Joey a light bulb moment. So as I was trying to get my life back together, I got into stand-up. And then when I was home, I'd just get on every open mic th that I did, and there was nothing really going on with it and then by the time i got to seattle in june of 95 was when i realized that i had to treat this as i would treat a business and it went right back to my car salesman days with joey now taking comedy seriously he finally had a life direction but the struggles of trying to make it as a stand-up comedian were beginning to take their toll on him you know how many times i cried myself to sleep after stand up yeah. I, I, as a man I hear you now. Because I said, it wasn't going well, or? Sure, sure. You're in a fucking hotel in Moscow, Idaho. And you just bombed at a fucking college. And they're giving you 50 bucks. And you owe on the rent. And you owe 600 on child support. And you, you, your kid hates you. Your wife hates you. Your girlfriend's sucking somebody else's dick. Right. And this is what happens. Broke as fuck. Getting living off a Subway veggie and cheese sandwich. Joey did not let this get him down. Instead, he showed the great resilience he developed from all the life setbacks he faced and the life of crime he previously lived. Like a true champion, he chose to persist despite his constant failures. But in the morning you wake up and you go, my kid could hate me, my wife could hate me, I could all the rent. <laughs> But one thing I could control is I get on stage and I do a lot better than what I did last night. That's right. You know what? You know what? Tomorrow I'll go get a job. Tonight I'm going to go fucking do a lot better than what I did last night. But tomorrow That's I'm going to go get a job. Yeah. I'm going to quit comedy. But then you do so well that night. Then you go, fuck it. I just bought myself another fucking month. Then Joey made a bold career move in 1995 when he moved from Colorado to L.A. after divorcing his first wife and losing contact with his daughter. After a few years of hustling and refining his craft, things got much better for Joey, and his bold move was beginning to pay off. I went out with a Latino transvestite for a while. Now they're hot. Oh, they're hot, bro. They cook, they clean. You can beat on them once in a while. Who are they going to tell? They got no support crews for these people. You know what I'm talking about? When the cops come, who are they going to believe? Me or some dude with a wig and a black eye? Figure this stuff out, folks. He just figured it out. And it coincided with him getting fat, which is wild, because he gave up on both things. He gave up on worrying what he looked like, and he gave up on worrying what people thought about him at the same time. Then in 1998, Joey was scouted by CBS for one of his performances in Seattle. And whilst it did not materialize into any stand-up gigs, it did open up a new door for Joey in Hollywood. Hey, Pete! What's the matter with Coop tonight? I don't know, but he's one for 11 and he smells like Christian Slater. Joey began acting and started appearing in both movies and TV shows, allowing him to finally find his feet. Joey no longer needed to worry about making money in illegitimate ways, so he could now focus on becoming the best actor and comedian he could possibly be. So I figured to get really good at comedy, you need to do 300 sets a year. 
His comedic career was slowly getting somewhere, and his acting career took off in 2004, when he made appearances in Law & Order and the blockbuster Spider-Man 2 film. This just ended. I got up to close my window before I went to sleep. That's my apartment right there. I seen a guy in a coat put a big-ass bundle of Lexus. He was parked right there. You want to get to him, you got to go through me. And me. Me too. Very well. Joey was slowly becoming more popular, but he was still waiting for his big break and was beginning to grow impatient. When he got cast into The Longest Yard with many great actors, he thought his time had come. I remember the movie getting released and uh -huh. just sitting at home looking at the phone. And nobody called. And then Nick Turturro got a bunch of movies and Lobo got a bunch of movies uh -huh. and Tracy Morgan got put in fucking... Dirty Rock and Terry Crews, forget what happened uh, with Terry uh, Crews. And there I, didn't, I was. I forgot he was in this movie. Yeah, there I was, the fucking ugly chick at the dance. For a few more years, Joey continued doing the odd stand-up set whilst mainly acting in Hollywood TV shows and movies, and in 2007, even took up a side gig for the UFC. Hey, fucko, it's Joey Karate today, you understand me? And you're here for the UFC Minute. Joey then made an appearance in the Dog That Saved Christmas movie in 2009, soon after he decided it was time to take his career into his own hands, when he started a new podcast called Beauty and the Beast with fellow comedian Felicia Michaels, where he occasionally dropped a crazy story from his past. I started a podcast with Felicia. I told a story about mugging a hooker and lighting her fucking wig on fire and taking her to a cemetery in Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Joey continued doing stand-up whilst hosting his podcast and, slowly, grew his fan base. This was the point of Joey's career when his great comedic ability was beginning to show. I smoke reefer like a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you wanna put a new tooth in your mouth? You look like, I don't wanna look like a movie star. Look at my face. What good is a face like this? With nice teeth. You know what I mean? In the early 2010s, hilarious appearances on JRE also boosted Joey's popularity, as it showed a wide audience his great storytelling ability. So when I shit, when you shit outside, it's not going to be a decent shit. Yeah. It's going to be like explosive. Like uh. So when I got up, it looks like somebody got shot in the head. There was shit all behind me on the wall. So she's sitting there with her little French poodles and her little chihuahuas, and she's looking at the wall like, what the fuck happened there? And all of a sudden, she actually walks up close to it. And squints and looks down on it and looks around and runs in the house. I'm watching all this. I can't breathe. We went in there, we walk in, and she goes, Rule number one, you are not gonna fuck me. It's five in the morning. There goes my fucking. There goes this night. And all of a sudden she looks at me, she goes, Well, if you could guess the color of my panties, I'll fuck you. I'm like, Okay, red. And she goes, They're green, but good enough. <laughs> Now, with the spotlight beginning to shine on Joey, he discovered vlogging, and he began documenting his everyday life. Look at that fucking monster from the Black Lagoon. Speaks with the earrings. This is a fun-filled afternoon. Why go to the museum? Target. Look at these fucking mooks. Look at that with the glasses. He's a fucking beast. <laughs> then in 2012 came the Church of What's Happening Now podcast, which brought an end to the Beauty and the Beast podcast with Felicia Michaels and introduced Joey's infamous producer and sidekick, Lee Syatt, to the world. It's safe to say, as a pair, they have given us many legendary moments on the podcast over the years. I had a girl come over, took her shirt off, stayed the night, sucked it, but wouldn't take her. She slept in her jeans. What? Yeah. Was she on her period? I don't know. Did you ask? No. Did you touch? I touched over the jeans, but yeah, she wouldn't take her jeans off. Why didn't black you take them off? Cock. What would you do if she had a big back cock? Joey! <laughs> she it would, it would what be, would you do with all the pictures of dicks they got? <laughs> Let me tell you something. I can live to be a thousand. I won't send you a picture of my dick. No. I'll show you my nutsack <laughs> all day long. <laughs> I'll put it on album covers. I'll do the whole fucking thing. Me and my buddy like, oh, she was banging. He goes, I'll tell you what. He goes, tell, tell these guys how hot she was. And me and my buddy's like, yeah, she was hot. And he's like, oh, when can we see it? He goes, listen, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. <laughs> he goes, listen, I'm going to fuck her tonight in the living room. And I'll leave the window open. You guys can come by and listen. <laughs>
Joey often recalls crazy stories from his criminal past during his podcast's episodes. There was a time when I was doing some creepy shit. I was, I was going from Colorado to Jersey and trading guns for coke. And, to, and my buddy was in summer school, but to let him get out for the day, I had to go bribe the teacher. I knew the teacher did blow. So I called the teacher, and I gave him a piece of Coke, and he said to me, no, 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 do me another piece. Make me a 40. Let me th let me get you on Friday. So I broke the piece. I go, just give me a 50 on Friday. It's Monday morning. We pulled my friend from class. I blackmailed the teacher. I robbed the bar mitzvah once. It's one of the most embarrassing things I ever did. You know, I still think about it once a week. And the guy takes money from his wallet, cash, and puts it in this envelope, licks it. And when the mother comes out, he gives it to the mother or the cat. I don't know who the fuck it was. So when they would stack up, they'd come to me and go, put those envelopes in the back. I just saw it, and I remember what color it was. <laughs> I opened that envelope up. There was fucking a deuce in there or something, 300 bucks. I go, wait a second. I got 100 envelopes here. I hit the jackpot. I'm just going to walk out of here with the fucking envelopes. That's how crazy I was. But I took 20 of them. I ripped them open, and whoever had a check... I just threw it in the garbage. In episode 128, Joey took it upon himself to call the guy he kidnapped 26 years ago. From the bottom of my heart, I'm just really sorry how I acted that day, and I'm sorry how things went down. Beside that, how you are you, what? my friend? No. It's all good, man. You're forgiven. I love you, brother. On and off this podcast, Joey's contagious laugh evoked wild giggles out of both podcast guests and live crowds. Here we go. In Puerto Rican now, so we go... <laughs> Throughout his career, his strong New Jersey personality and magnificent storytelling ability has ensured he is loved by everyone he dealt with. I bumped into the, He said you robbed his house for a car stereo, an eight ball, and his social security check. Fuck yeah, I did. And he even said to himself, he goes, you did so well, I forgive you. He goes, you turned to do something with your life, I forgave you. I just want you to know I'm cheering for you and shit. Thank you for robbing me. He goes, it's an honor. <laughs> His childhood, criminal past, and jail experiences have ensured he's never run out of original material that no other comedian could match. So the whole sixth grade year, I was by the book. I fucking did my own laundry, I made my own breakfast, and I would go to work in her bar in the afternoon. I would go to karate, I got A's. But then something fucked up happened in the seventh grade. I fell in love. I fell in love with the skinny chick, flat chested, the whole fucking thing. <laughs> but there was no sex involved. We were just dry humping like motherfuckers. We would go home every day and dry hump to death, like two album sides. Like that's that was the minimum. Like two album sides. I would fuck up a zipper every day. Like every day. We did the acid. We had the fucking beer. And then the cops came to our party behind the high school and they ruined everything. So we started running on and then on the acid was hitting me and I'm fucked up. And I hooked up with this girl. She's like, run this way. And we hid behind this little mosquito hut, like where you go when the mosquitoes are out in the summer. And she's like, you want to make out? We started making out. And I sucked the tits a little bit. She had really big tits. So the acid fucked me up. Her tits were even bigger on the acid. So I'm like, I don't want to suck your tits no more. And I just ran out of there. I had a friend in the kitchen. His name was Etchy. And he was like a, a blood. And one day he came up to me. He's like, hey, bro, you got to help me out. I'm like, what's up? He goes, my freezers are slipping. <laughs> what? My freezers are fucking up. You got to help me out. I'm like, what are you talking about? What the fuck is a freeze? He goes, a freeze. When you don't practice it, people could tell the difference in your voice. Mm -hmm. When you don't practice saying freeze, when you're going to rob somebody. <laughs> so, ah! so this motherfucker, oh, this motherfucker <laughs> will come into the dining area and go, freeze! <laughs> he will go, don't report me. I, I just want to try it. He goes, my brother got out of jail, didn't practice his freezes, he got locked up a week later. Because <laughs> his, freezes, his freezes didn't have no confidence behind him. I mean, bro, I'm like, this is a funny fucking situation here. Joey did very well to make something out of himself after the first 18 years of life gave him a 99% chance to end up dead or in jail. And, fortunately, Joey did eventually get over his mother's death. I go, fuck it, let me go downstairs. I heard the water on, like she was washing dishes or some shit. And I walked down the stairs real slowly, and when I went around the kitchen, I looked into the kitchen. I didn't see her by the dish, by the dishes, but when I looked down, she was on the floor dead. Her arm was purple. And I went over to her, and I touched her pulse, and I said, I fucking knew she would never find out I got left back. <laughs> 
It's safe to say Joey Diaz has lived a crazier life than all other comedians, and there will never be anyone like him. But this other comedian has lived a crazy life.